Hello and welcome. If you didn't get a chance to listen to my suggestions podcast, that episode, that short one, a few minutes, I'll go through it real quick. Moving forward, ideas. I always say that a podcast should have a set schedule and an overarching theme, but it needs to be fluid. I don't want it, like this one, I don't want it to stagnate. My goal this summer when I'm off is to devote time to organize this podcast and to think about five ideas that I came up with. Themes, like for example, a theme like slavery, and then do a few episodes on that. Show and tell, where I show you things from New Jersey history, like little, like objects. I think I, I, think I showed this, right, like a little bottle, like silly things. A listener story series, so you can you can maybe record yourself, or you can just send me uh, some messages about an experience you had, some place you visited. That could be like paranormal. I want to get into that a little bit. I said in the in the uh, um, suggestions episode that I'm a skeptic on that, so maybe you can share some of your stories. Another idea is guest speakers. I'm definitely moving forward with this. I've got a couple lined up already, and class trips where I go places. And record from there. Um, a friend of mine and a colleague, we got, we went to graduate school together, and she, uh, we taught for a, a while at the same college. She uh, also teaches public school like I do. She was um, telling me that I know she does a lot with her YouTube channel, and one thing I have to learn how to do is uh, edit videos. I'm not going to edit these because if I make a mistake or something, I'll just correct myself because it's more informal. But if I'm filming somewhere you know, like maybe background noise or somebody walks in front. I have to learn how to, to get to um, edit videos in that regard. But I will be taking trips, places, and broadcasting from there. So let me know what you think about these ideas or propose some others. Um, has anyone ever gone to New York City to see a Broadway play? If you have, raise your hand. I won't be able to see you, but if we were in person, I would. If you've ever seen a Broadway play, think about it. Or should I say a... Juan Rodriguez Way play instead of Broadway. Juan Juan Rodriguez Way. What does that even mean? In 2012, part of Broadway from 159th Street to 218th Street was named Juan Rodriguez Way in honor of New York's first immigrant. Welcome to the New Jersey History Podcast. This is your host, Kyle Whitfield Banner. Today, we will be discussing the story of Juan, sometimes called Jan, J-A-N, Rodriguez the first foreign inhabitant of New Netherlands, later New York. The backdrop of our discussion will be Dutch colonial New York pre-1664. And this took place well before the co-naming of Broadway in honor of the first immigrant to New Netherland, Jan or Juan Rodriguez. There are two disclaimers about this episode. First, it is not about New Jersey history in that the area was not called New Jersey, when our story takes place. Remember, before this was New Jersey, this was all New York. Before that, it was part of the Dutch colony of New Netherland. So this is we're talking about New Netherland. Can you hear the the um, people going by on those those bikes? And they do that in those big, uh, loud trucks, too. I always like to make comments about those people's anatomy, but I'm not going to say it in, in, in a public podcast, but I would imagine there's maybe some compensation there, but I didn't just say that, did I? So now, before this was New Jersey, it was all New York, before that it was Dutch Colony New Netherland, and before that, this was the land of the native indigenous people, the Lenape. Second disclaimer, the months seem to overlap, like in, in when I'm talking about uh, Jan or Juan Rodriguez. In the historical record, there's some overlapping. There's not as much information about him and about what I'm talking about as I, as you, you would like there to be. But there is a good amount of information, but some of the dates overlap, and you'll probably pick that up as we go through it. So let's take a look at um, Jan Rodriguez or Juan Rodriguez. I'll refer to him by both names. Juan would be the Spanish version. Jan would be the Dutch Rodriguez. I did not set out to make this episode about Jan Rodriguez. His story, however, is a good segue into the next few episodes, which will focus on the origins of slavery in New Jersey. I had forgotten about Rodriguez until I began my research on the topic of slavery in early Dutch colonial, what's now New Jersey. I learned about him, I, I had to be during my master's degree, so during later college, 
because I didn't learn about it in high school, and I don't think it was during my undergraduate. So it had to have been in my New Jersey history class or one of those classes later on. Jan Rodriguez was born to an African mother and a Portuguese sailor in the Captaincy General of Santo Domingo. That's now the Dominican Republic. In an era when a tenth of the Dominican population was born in Portugal. Because of his place of birth, many people now, especially Dominican-Americans, refer to Rodriguez as Dominican. So like they might say, he was the first Dominican in America. It reminds me of Columbus Day. Does anyone know what I mean by that? Because of his place of birth, many people now, especially Dominican-Americans, refer to Rodriguez as Dominican. So like the first Dominican-American in America. Think of Columbus Day. Columbus Day was not really a thing until the Italian-Americans arrived in the latter part of the 19th century. It wasn't a thing in America. Facing severe discrimination, Italian immigrants sought a way to tie their cultural heritage to that of their new country, the United States. What better way so to do than by extolling the achievements of the man who discovered the new world, part of which would later become the United States? So Columbus Day, we're not even talking about that now, so you might, you might vilify Columbus, with many people, which many people do. We shouldn't have Columbus Day. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that it was a holiday and for many parts of the country still is. We have that partly because Italian-Americans wanted to have a, a tie-in to the American experience because they were so discriminated against. They wanted to be, have a tie-in to their new country. I would imagine maybe Dominican-Americans feel the same way when they learn about Rodriguez. So he's... Many people refer to him as the first Dominican-American um, person, and many people refer to him as the first immigrant to New York, which would eventually become New Netherland and then New York and New Jersey. All right. So similarly, what better way to be part of the early narrative of American history for Dominican-Americans than to have their own person, one of their own people, Rodriguez, as the first immigrant to New York? So hopefully you understand that. When people move to a new place, they, they like to have a tie-in to the place, especially if their group of people is, is facing discrimination. According to Jamie Lewis in her article, Juan, Singular Sensation, I love that, New York's first immigrant in 1609 when sailing for the Dutch, English explorer Henry Hudson discovered the river that now carries his name. Today we make a major hullabaloo around his alleged first European contact. But back then, there was little interest even from those whom he'd sent, whom, who'd sent him. Even the rough map of the Lower Hudson River provided to its Dutch masters was passed along to other traders. One company, the Van Tuyhuysen Syndicate, was keen to get a foothold in the burgeoning fur trade. It sent out skipper Hendrik Christensen to investigate in 1611. Upon arrival, the wary captain anchored away from the unfamiliar coast and made his sorties ashore. During one of these, he kidnapped two boys from a local Lenape village. Christensen felt the two boys, he renamed them Orson and Valentine, would generate public interest upon his return to Amsterdam. Does that remind you of anything else or anyone else in American history? This was the same sort of calculated publicity stunt that echoed Columbus and predated John Rolfe's promotional promenade of Pocahontas by five years. So this Dutchman, Christensen, is coming, um, comes to New York after Hudson, two years after Hudson maps it out, the Hudson River, comes here, takes two Native American boys and brings them back to the Netherlands, back to Amsterdam, to like show them around, not for their benefit, but to show the people, hey, look, these are not savages. Columbus did the same thing. He took natives back to Spain for the same reason. They, it, it, was, it was enslavement. John Rolfe would later do the same thing when he married Pocahontas at the, the Jamestown settlement. Um, that story was a little bit different because uh, they did get married. I'm not, I'm not saying that their marriage was what marriages are today, but he, John Rolfe, brought Pocahontas back to England to show them that, look, I married one of these people. They can't all be bad. And she was a hit over there. Sadly, she died, I believe, of fever on their way back. So they, they didn't even leave England, and she died on a ship. She's buried over in England in a place called Gravesend. And then John Rolfe and Thomas, their son, came back to Virginia. So there you go. 
So what my point here is, even before we talk about our main character here, uh, Jan Juan or Juan Rodriguez, you've got the Dutch mapping out this area of what is now New York, right across from New Jersey, the Hudson River, and it not being a very big deal at first until people start coming over. Unfortunately for Christensen, the Dutch explorer and you could say, I guess you could say uh, colonizer, the publicity meant his new highly profitable source of furs was now an open secret. So he comes over here, takes two native Indian boys back to Amsterdam and parades them around like, oh, look, these are the nice natives coming from that are in the new world. That makes people want to then go there. So he didn't, he really didn't have um, what could have maybe been a monopoly, his company, on fur trading in that area. The next spring, this is after 1611, so this would have been probably 1612-ish, a Dutch merchant working for the same company, Adrian Block, returned to map the area in order to establish a permanent trading post. Block and the Van Tuyhuizen Company enjoyed two months of uninterrupted trade. Then, when he was preparing for the return journey to Amsterdam in the late summer, another Dutch ship, captained by Thies Mossel, arrived in the Hudson Bay by way of Santo Domingo, the biggest port in Spanish Hispaniola, the island we now know as the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Captain Mossel had a secret weapon aboard, Juan, or Jan Rodriguez, a gifted linguist hired in Hispaniola to act as an interpreter. Whilst the merchants argued about prices and market shares, Rodriguez apparently decided that a ship returning to the West Indies was not in his best interests. As the mulatto child of a slave, his future prospects in the West Indies or the Netherlands were equally poor. He obtained the balance of his salary from Mossel and promptly departed for the wooded shoreline of Manhattan, from the Lenape word meaning land of many hills. We call that Manhattan today. So here's this Jan Rodriguez, Juan Rodriguez, working for a Dutch captain, comes here and says, you know what? I'm not going back to the West Indies, the Caribbean. I'm not going, I'm not going to the Netherlands. I'm staying here. Block one of the original Dutch fur merchants, complained vehemently that Thies Mossel, captain of the young Tobias, that's a ship, had tried to wreck his trade by charging three times more for a beaver than Block. In his report against Mossel, which he filed with the Amsterdam notary upon his return to Holland, Block summed up his list of accusations against him. This is a quote. Rodriguez, a crewman, had made a permanent home in Manhattan border, trading and living among the Indians. Rodriguez, a Santo Domingo local who had come with the said Mossel ship, stayed ashore at the same position as the said Mossel ship sailed away from the river. Eighty hatchets, a few knives, a musket, and a sword were given to Rodriguez. End quote. According to Block, Mossel denied that Rodriguez was acting on his behalf. Rodriguez had made it his mission to make friends with the natives, open a trading station, and settle down on Manhattan Island. So Adrian Block assumed Rodriguez was working for Mossel, Rodriguez's original captain, and charging unfair prices on behalf of Mossel. The truth was that Rodriguez was a merchant in his own right and was charging his own prices. Let me explain that. So Rodriguez is on a ship. He decides not to go back with, with the captain or the crew. Another trader comes along, and Rodriguez is there selling goods. The trader assumes that he's working for another Dutch captain because he and, and he says you're you're charging exorbitant prices for these goods, other Dutch captain. Rodriguez was working on his own; he was not part of the captain's crew anymore. So I guess there is the there's the assumption. I'll give you an analogy in, in a minute. There's the assumption that. You must be, you're not a European, he's, he's half Portuguese, you're not a European, so you are clearly not in business for yourself. You must be working on behalf of this other captain, so the other captain is approached, and it was really Rodriguez who was charging the prices that he wanted to charge for the goods that he was selling. Let me break that down for you. Imagine a father owns a business, and his son works with him. Then the son branches out on its own and starts charging customers higher prices than the father charges. Customers complain to the father that the son is charging too much in the father's business, but the son is now operating a separate business. 
right? So hopefully that makes sense, except Masel and Rodriguez were not father and son. So I guess what, just to go back to what I said before, there's the assumption that because Rodriguez is not as white as the other people, that he must be the servant, slave, whatever you want, employee of another Dutch trader. And that other Dutch trader is making him charge exorbitant prices for whatever goods he's selling. When in, when in reality, he left the service of the Dutch captain he was working for. He got goods and he was selling them on his own. So he was charging his own prices. He wasn't charging them for somebody else, which is what the assumption is. Um, the important issue is that the inhabitants recognized Rodriguez as the island's first trader, preferring Rodriguez's pro uh, products in ironware to their own, the inhabitants being the Indians. I guess that they had gotten ironware from other places. They wanted his. They wanted what he had. Maybe he treated them well. I didn't get into that. I do think, um, I'll talk about it later, but I do think him staying there, Rodriguez staying in New York, among the natives, he must have had a, a positive relationship with them. And he lived among them. He didn't live on the ships, which I'll talk about in a minute. Jamie, Lo uh, Jamie Lewis goes on to state, quote, taking up residence on the shore is what cements Rodriguez's place in the history books. Previously, the Dutch had stuck to the security and relative comfort of their anchored vessels. Rodriguez decided to set up shop and trade the goods he'd received from Mossel to the local tribes. His plan obviously worked because when Block, Mossel, and Christensen returned, not only had Rodriguez survived the winter, he'd established a business relationship with the Lenape. So um, the way the Dutch did this, and other, other explorers did it as well, was they, they'd moor their ships, right? The ships would dock, let's say, and they'd get off, explore, do their thing, trade with the natives, fight, of course, they fought with the natives, whatever interactions with the natives. And then, like, at night, the Dutch would go back to their ship, sleep on board the ship. They'd eat maybe on board the ship. The ship was safe. They could protect um, themselves on the ship. They felt secure there. Here's Rodriguez, who's living off the ship, but this is where it wasn't clear. He really didn't have a ship to live on anyway. I think the point is that he was very comfortable living in a village in a little area with the natives. Whereas if when the Dutch were there, they stayed on board their ships. They would go off on, off the ship during the day, hunt, whatever it was they did, explore, trade, then come back to the ship. Rodriguez is very comfortable, I suppose you could say, not even having a ship to go back to. So he's living among the natives. In August of 1613, Captain Hendrik Christensen returned to Manhattan Island. On the beach, he met Rodriguez, who told him that he was, quote, a free man. After that, Rodriguez went to work for Christensen. Again, Rodriguez declared himself a free man, despite the fact that his employer considered him as nothing more than a servant. Now, this disagreement heralded the first of many cultural collisions of this nature, where um, you have a person who is non-white, non-European, or maybe mixed blood. They call the people mulattoes. They're even Creoles. We'll talk about that word in a minute uh, toward the end, where they would, were free. They were not slaves. They would hire their services out to a person, and then that person would think that they kind of owned them, and they would not treat them as a free person. I think that kind of makes it, it, we don't agree with it, but I think it makes sense to everybody. They just didn't believe in, in equality the way we do. They thought of things differently, unfortunately. Rodriguez exemplified the diverse abilities exhibited by the first group of African immigrants to New Netherland. People of African descent who later arrived in New York and New Jersey would not be considered immigrants, however. Jan Rodriguez was Portuguese and half black, and he was the first immigrant to what became Dutch New Netherland. I know this is, there's a lot of information here. This is probably one of the more intricate episodes that I've done so far with a lot of details, but I, I, felt, I, I, I felt compelled to do this. I don't know why. Rodriguez spent his first winter in Lower Manhattan without the support of a moored ship. Remember, we talked before about how the Dutch often stayed on their ships. He stayed at a Dutch fur trading operation founded by Hendrik Christensen, the man we talked about before. And when we say without the, the, the um, support of a moored ship, he didn't have that safety. So he must have been relatively safe with the natives. Again, there's an example of that. This little hamlet, this little area where he lived, like others along the North River, that's what they call the Hudson River, was a, pro, a for-profit venture. So Rodriguez 
is living in this settlement that was created to make profit, right? And Rodriguez was doing what colonizers do. Colonizers go, they set up shop, they often take land, of course, they trade with the natives, often enslave the natives, but Rodriguez was doing what colonizers do as a person of color. However, he was not doing the enslavement part. So just hold on to that because I'll get back to that. Rodriguez was an interpreter for the local Rockaway Indians and helped the Indians and Christensen make a trade deal. The young Tobias, that was Christensen's ship, came back the following April. Captain Mossel, who had originally left Rodriguez behind and called him a black rascal because he didn't stick with the team, there was a fight that happened between um, Christensen and Mossel. And um, during the fight that followed, Rodriguez was hurt by Mossel's crew, but Christensen's crew was able to save him from getting hurt further. After the two ships left, Rodriguez stayed behind and had children with women from the Rockaway tribe. So I don't know if he got married. It says women. That's what I came across. That's where something is amiss, kind of in the, the modern rediscovery of the story of Rodriguez. We want to include him as a part of the narrative of American history as a person of color. I don't have to tell you, um, I'm not going to get into critical race theory. I'm not going to get into the these different um, programs that are being offered to and sometimes pushed on school districts to uh, rethink history in a certain way. But I will say this. If you don't think that people of color, I, I really don't feel comfortable using that term, but who am I? If you don't feel, if you don't really agree that people of color have been marginalized in American history or not enough do uh, credit has been given to them, then there's something wrong with you. All right. Um, you, you've got people who are people of color. Again, I don't like that term who contributed greatly to American history and a lot of people don't even know who they are. But that's something that we'll be addressing in this podcast. This podcast is not designed to simply include people of color. It's designed to show or demonstrate how Americans contributed to American history. You also have to, or one must, a person must acknowledge Rodriguez as a person of color who was the first immigrant to New York, but he was a colonizer. He was a colon. He came here to make money and make a new life for himself. That's why he came here. Albeit, he was one who had a positive relationship with the Indians, almost reminiscent of William Penn and his holy experiment of Pennsylvania established 67 years later. Peaceful interactions with the natives. Rodriguez started a life of his own on his own terms. He made his own dealings with the Indians and behaved more like a settler than one might think, considering him being a person of color. Rodriguez was a black immigrant merchant. Yes, Tank, he was a black immigrant merchant. Tank's very, he said, what, a black immigrant merchant? Yes, yes, you might not have learned that in dog school, but they did exist. He just let out this amazingly loud noise if you didn't hear that. Rodriguez was a black immigrant merchant, the first in what would become New Netherland and later New York. So I'm kind of just repeating myself there. We need to rewind a little bit, though, before Rodriguez's time and before the Dutch arrived in what would become New Netherland, New York, New Jersey. The Dutch were not the original people to explore the East Coast. And the New York, New Jersey area had seen other European explorers before the Dutch arrived. We know Hudson sailed here in 1609. He was an Englishman. He was sailing for the Dutch. But Giovanni de Verrazzano had explored here for France in the 1520s. With regard to Rodriguez's arrival, many people want to reinterpret history by drawing attention to Rodriguez being half black, and that makes sense, right? Rodriguez was the first immigrant to settle in what would become New Netherland, and every group, as I said before, wants to be a part of the story that makes up a country's history, especially if that group has been marginalized or ignored in American history classrooms. We get that. But... Some people may wonder, and I got a couple questions on this with um, the Asbury Park episode. Some people may wonder why they didn't learn about this in school. I didn't learn about it until I was probably in graduate school. I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but I think you'll see how it ties in. History classrooms often do not go in depth when it comes to teaching lesser known topics, 
especially those not discussed in schools in past decades. So if you're a history teacher and you didn't learn about it, chances are you're not going to teach about it. However, there are teachers who have an elementary understanding of their subject matter, and they do not further their research after graduating from college. Like they just don't take, they don't go anywhere with it. They stick with what they know, and that's it. That's not good. In addition, history teachers are not offered professional development opportunities designed to hone their craft. But we have plenty of staff development on increasing state testing. We certainly do have that. And professional workshops on the wonders of Google Classroom. But we don't have many opportunities to actually hone the craft of teaching history. So to answer a couple of questions that people might have when listening to that, I know if I listened to this episode 20 years ago, I would say, I didn't know who Jan Rodriguez was or Juan Rodriguez. I, why didn't I know this? There's so many things that I look at now as I'm studying, going more in depth with history, even in the history of New Jersey, that I say to myself, why didn't I know this? Of course, you can't know everything. Um, but we really have to look at what we as teachers, if there are any teachers out there, what we and people like me do um, on our own time with regard to honing our own craft, so to speak. Like, if you wonder why you don't learn about certain things in, in school, it's because the teachers don't know it themselves. I'm not saying that I'm great because I just said it two seconds ago. I'm learning more as I delve into this New Jersey history podcast. So we need to be lifelong learners. I, learners, I guess that's the, the um, um, takeaway right there. In conclusion, and in preparation for our next topic, which is the origins of slavery in New Jersey, Graham Russell Hodges points out in his book, Root and Branch, Africans had been going across the Atlantic Basin for hundreds of years. There was no doubt that some of the fishermen, pirates, and unknown explorers who came before Rodriguez had been there. Esteban Gomez, a black Portuguese pilot, was the most famous. In 1525, he sailed up the Hudson River and called it Deer River. The next day, Gomez left with 37 Indian slaves. Rodriguez was the first person who didn't come from Manhattan Island to live there. He is important to this history for more than just being the first African American known to have lived on the island. First, his background is typical of the cosmopolitan black sailors who worked in the Atlantic Basin in the 1600s. Rodriguez was like the Atlantic Creoles, who had both West, Afri West Indian and African roots. Ira Berlin has said about people like Rodriguez, he had a lot of survival skills. He talked business with greedy ship captains and was very important for trade with the local Indians because he quickly learned their language and married into the Rockaway tribe. He's the only one of these early explorers known to have adopted and adapted to both European and Native American ways of life but he was not the first person of color to be in our part of the new world. And people of color, this is these are my words, and people of color would continue to play a seminal role in the colonization and settlement of what would become New Jersey. So our next probably two episodes will be on slavery in New Jersey. I don't know. Well, I am going to start the next episode on early slavery, like, like the, with the Dutch colonization and everything, uh, bringing slaves into Bergen, which was in northern New Jersey. If you can, um, I'm giving you a homework assignment. I'd like you to look up so you know what I'm talking about, even though I will explain it any, anyway. Next time I, I'll discuss the colonial origins of slavery in New Jersey. If you want to research a bit ahead, look up these words and people. Number one, Dust, Dutch West India Company. Number two, Patroon, P-A-T-R-O-O-N. Number three, Bowery. Number four, William Kieft, and number five, Pavonia, with a capital P. My research for this episode, Root and Branch, Amer African Americans in New York and East Jersey, 1613 to 1863, by Graham Russell Hodges. Number two, Stories of Slavery in New Jersey, by Rick Gefkin. Number three, Juan Rodriguez and the Beginnings of New York City, Anthony Stevens Acevedo, Tom Wetterings, and Lenora Alvarez Francis and Juan Singular Sensation by New York's New York's First Immigrant by Jamie Lewis. If you want, um, I guess, links to those, I will put them in the podcast episode 
details, so you, you'll have those. So hopefully you enjoyed that little bit of information on Jan or Juan Rodriguez, depending on if you're a Dutch or Spanish-speaking person, how you're going to say that. And hopefully you know that the people of color, again, that term, people of color were not only brought here as slaves. Uh, they, those people of that, that background took it upon themselves to not work for European sea captains anymore and become merchants. We see the same thing happen when we look at the early colonization of New Jersey by the Dutch. Not every person of color was a slave. So that's that. If you have any questions or comments, keep them to yourself. Just kidding. Email me, njhistorypodcast at gmail.com, or you can message me on, um, a lot of people do this, I think it's just easier, on Instagram, the New Jersey History Podcast. A lot of people message me there. Again, I think it's just easier. People are on Instagram all the time. I will end this here. Um, Next time I will be back in the college in one of the quiet rooms recording, but I had to come home early today to get some stuff done here, so that's why I'm here. Have a wonderful day, and again, any questions or comments, please feel free to message me.